Hi, everyone. Here we are, motivating you to be more creative. I'm Rod Jones. And I'm Angie Jones. Welcome to the Thought Row podcast. We invite you to subscribe wherever you listen, and we are available virtually anywhere you listen to your podcast. That's right, Angie. I know people will want to think more creatively, mm-hmm. and they'll, they're going to benefit from our weekly shows. What are we discussing today? Okay, so today we're going to be discussing curating, especially art curation. And we have an excellent guest we will be interviewing that I know you guys are going to really like. This is going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, But first, how about that quote for the week? Oh, okay. The quote is, the beautiful thing about learning is nobody can take it away from you. And it's a quote by B.B. King. Who said that? B.B. King. Now, you know, I don't know that I personally would expect uh, that type of quote from him, although I don't know why. Right. But that's pretty insightful. I think it is. I think it is because it is. It's true. Once you learn something, it's it's deep in your psyche and you have it, whether you necessarily remember it or not. Yeah. Retaining things that we learn sometimes could be difficult, especially if, uh, like uh, math for me. Yeah, math for me, too. Yeah. Like, but no. after but after that, it seems like these things that you learn pop up in your mind, sometimes years later, and you go, oh, I remember that. Mm-hmm. So it that, that's a, a fabulous quote. It is. I, th- I think everyone will ha- enjoy that for today. Before we get into the topic today, mm-hmm. I thought it would be a good idea to tell the people about what our podcast is all about. You know, that's really a good idea, Rod. Um, first, let me start out by saying that On our show, Thought Row Podcast, we share with you the conversations that we have with talented people from all over the world. We speak to real creatives that come from all walks of life and are real life superstars pursuing their own passions and dreams. You know, I've also learned that it's a place where everyone can learn about how to be more creative in everything they do. Absolutely. We get a lot of feedback in that area, which has been very positive. And uh, people do learn from the things that we say, but more importantly, we learn from our guests. So, well, I don't know if it's more importantly, but we do learn a lot from our guests. Our podcast is a conversation between Rod and I and our guests, and you will learn from their experiences, insights, and travels in life. They cover a wide range of topics, and I'm sure will be of great interest to anyone that is or wants to be more creative. On with the show, curating. I'm going to hit you with a hard question right off the top. Okay. Uh, What does curating mean to you? You're going to ask me. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, one thing I know for sure, in virtually all cases, there would not be art exhibitions because someone has to select the art, organize it, be involved in hanging and presenting. So um, curating, what does it mean to you, Rod? I'm going to... Twist it back to you. Yeah, well, but the unfortunate thing is you took all the good answers. Oh, no. Well, unfortunately, as I said, you covered much of what I probably would have thought to say. Um, There have been some really famous curators, and many of them started out curating their own personal collections. By curating their own personal collections, they learn a lot about art. They discover a lot of different artists. And a good example of that, I think, would be Peggy Guggenheim. Mm -hmm. In fact... Her collecting just about got her um, disowned from the Guggenheim Museum yeah. family. Yeah, that was not a good time for her. Because well, that's what she was collecting. She was collecting, but she was being so innovative and so ahead of her time. And I think people were still, they were not into contemporary art at the time. It was kind of uh, on the fringe. No, I can imagine that family conversation around the Guggenheim mansion was, yeah. what the heck do you think you're doing, Peggy? Yeah, and why are you wasting your time with this so-called art? It's not really art. And that sentiment was all around Europe, really, and it took a while for them to change their It took their a while ideas. for it to get adopted into the, yeah. uh, the U.S. And there, there were a lot of, and here, too, yeah. Yeah, there were a lot of critics and art curators that promulgated that. Art critics, interestingly enough, have also become curators. Mm-hmm. Uh, as they form people's opinions about certain artists. Mm -hmm. I think that's what they do. Um, These curators gravitate to those artists uh, and build exhibitions basically on what they're hearing uh, art critics say. So true. 
So true. And being, it's kind of interesting though, because you can take someone that the art critics like and they build a show, make them, you know, super famous and icon. And then, and then they kind of phase them out in a couple of years. So it's kind of like a ever going uh, stream of people. I think the art critics do that so they can go get a glass of wine and cheese at all those shows. Some free snacks. No, no, not really. But um, also a good example of that would be probably Clement Greenberg. He championed Jackson Pollock as the greatest artist of his generation. That's a really good example. Mm-hmm. In fact, you could argue that between him yeah. and Lee Krasner, mm-hmm. Peggy Guggenheim, yeah, they made Jackson Pollock a household name in the art world. They did through his kind of eccentric personality and that wonderful uh, article in Life magazine, I think it was, yep. with the fantastic pictorial they did on him. It, they just made him so iconic, and that was the rage. Yeah, Jack the Dripper. That always sounds creepy to it, me. Yeah, and you know what? Lee Krasner, all the way up until uh, she was very old and probably didn't have much time left. Yeah. She would just rail on that. She, so she didn't dig it. No, they used to go, what does that mean? She goes, well, I don't know what it means, but I hate it. I absolutely hate it. And you know what? I have to agree with her. It is kind of a tacky thing to say because that certainly wasn't yeah. what his art was really all about. No, but I'll tell you what, it kind of reminds me, this is really strange, of a Vincent Price movie. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, so Isn't yeah. it though, Jack the Drop, Dripper? Oh yeah, my Jack gosh. Jack the Dripper. Well, Vincent Price could have played his uh, role, I guess. True. And then interesting, there are curators that curate performance art, like Rosalie Goldberg and others, that it's not always about paintings only. It's not. In fact, you can curate just about anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, You could. I mean, people curate a menu or a meal, too. Yeah. What about art dealers? They have heavily influenced taste like Leo Castelli. Oh, yeah. He helped the contemporary art movement, not only in America, but he influenced its acceptance uh, throughout Europe. That's very true. I mean, they do influence, even to this day, what is popular, what's valuable, what is wanted. You know, we're talking right now, we're not talking about contemporary art collectors or curators. We're talking about people from the past, but I think just about every art Mm -hmm. curator, Mm -hmm. every art dealer, they all have read all of their books and they've learned a lot from them. And I can often see it in how curators talk today. Mm -hmm. They kind of mirror the things that I've actually read in books. So you know where they're getting, you know where they're getting information, but you, you have to study and you have to learn your craft no matter what it is that you do. Well, don't you think though, it's kind of like when... A great general studies a war situation or great uh, leaders in other countries that they're not part of. They learn from their past experiences. And I feel like people do that over and over again as a model to what maybe they need to do or what they need to, how they need to handle their well, business. Well, every, every great general, they looked at everything Napoleon did, all of his strategies, right. all the way back to... Genghis Khan, if right. you will. I mean, there is a, they study. You're right. And so if you want to learn to become a good curator or if you want to be the old curators, uh, yeah, you study yeah. the curators from the past. Uh, that's probably where you're going to learn the most about what it is to be a curator. Mm-hmm. So true. And I guess the big question is, is it possible that anyone can become a curator? I think to me, it seems like it's all about your taste. If you have good taste level. Oh yeah. And that's arguable because that's so impressionable. I could have good taste about one thing and everybody else could absolutely hate what I think is good taste. Mm -hmm. You see that in design, especially interior design. Some people might really like purple on their walls Mm -hmm. and other people may detest it and they prefer to have green. Right. But curing is really a lot about having a good sense of taste But when it comes to curating art, you really have to understand art. You have to have studied it Mm -hmm. and you have to know what's good or bad, at least in your own personal opinion. But probably more important is your ability to create a show, curate a show where the audience, the people that come in to see the exhibition Mm -hmm. are comfortable 
and then it has a nice flow to it. You want people to come in the front door, look at the various paintings, and as they walk through the curated show, they go, oh, I really love this piece. I'm not so sure about that piece, but there has to be mm-hmm. a flow. You know, I'm going to say I kind of have a different opinion about that, and that is that some curators uh, are very, uh, they like to be controversial, or they like to make the attendee a little uncomfortable because what they're doing is, is it's kind of like almost a performance art, but really they're drawing out different emotions in the person attending this exhibition and they want to get them emotionally invested. And sometimes that is really effective in making the artwork that is on the walls or the sculptures or whatever you have in that exhibition become emotionally attaching to the to the attendee so sometimes it's uncomfortable sometimes it's uh unusual so it's not always about the comfort level it's about sometimes being a little disturbing i think and i'm not sure that i always love those exhibitions when it's disturbing because then it can be like it sticks in your mind in kind of a a negative way, especially if you're a very visual person like you and I are. You, you and I have walked yeah. out of shows like that. Or we sometimes, have. We I'll, have. I'll, sometimes I'll look around and I'll say, hey, Angie, this is not my space. I want out of here. Right. And you'll say, no, give it a chance. Take a look at this. Take a look at that. See what you see. Yeah, get and, the whole and I perspective. And have, I have to admit, you know, you've talked me in sometimes to yeah. looking a little bit beyond my own personal taste mm-hmm. and exploring it a little bit further. Right. But I also, there's been some pretty disgusting shows that I just could not stay in the building anymore. And as we were walking out the door, I would look at you and say, what the heck were they thinking? Yeah, yeah true. And I also that. noticed they didn't have big audiences. Well, some of them are a smaller audience crowd, really. But I guess it's all about a collection and presenting them in a cohesive, educational or innovative or emotionally, you know, stimulating kind of way. Well, curating a collection, you could curate just about any kind of collection. You could curate yeah. uh, a Barbie doll collection. Yeah. Some, some people would really like that. <laughs> well, I think now would be a good time to speak with our guest today, who is Maurice Quinney. Quinlan. I'm sorry for not saying that correctly, but he is Irish and I'm sure you're going to really enjoy his interview. Maurice, welcome, our talented friend. Welcome to the Thought Row podcast. Both Angie and I have been really looking forward to chatting with you for quite some yes, time, right? Hello. I'm very much looking forward to talking to yourselves. It's an honor to be interviewed by you both. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. That's so nice of you to say that. Well, our very first question is, you are a very creative and talented artist, and we are excited to talk to you about your career as a curator, but before we begin, we'd like to start a show by asking you what you had for breakfast. Our toughest question. Our hardest question. Absolutely, the question, the daunting question. Well, I normally get up around seven o'clock, make a mug of coffee. I go into the studio and I stare at the paintings and they stare back at me. So I kind of start my day that way. It, it always reminds me of a sketch from The Muppet Show where the, the, the main character is trying to outstare a tree in the st- <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. competition. And so you're, you're waiting for an inroad on the painting as you're having your coffee. I love it. I love it. Well, you live in a very beautiful city in Ireland. Tell us a little bit about where you live. Well, Lim- Limerick City was founded by the Vikings in around 922, so it's nearly 1,100 years old. It was built as a trading post on the River Shannon. Oh. I live between two rivers, the Shannon River, which is the longest river in Ireland, uh, the Abbey River, and uh, the Grand Canal. So I'm hugely influenced by water, obviously. Mm-hmm. So um, that's based basically where, where I live. It so sounds I've beautiful. literally got the city. It, it is absolutely gorgeous. We recently watched a documentary about the Vikings being in your area. Yeah, it was, real, area. it was really quite interesting. And the impact they had on yeah. Europe and how they kind of colonized Europe in, a, in an interesting way. In an way. interesting way, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, the, the rivers were their main kind of 
highway. So the Shannon River, they could literally navigate all the way up. They built the Abbey River around Limerick because there's a huge kind of waterfall stuck on the River Shannon. They couldn't get their boats up. So that's why they built the Abbey River, oh, which is about okay. 50, 50, 50 kilometers of a separate thing. So they could get all the way up, up the Shannon. Um, it's, what's, it's what's 360 kilometers long. So not as long as any of the rivers that you guys have, but, uh, you know, it's for, for right. it, it's fairly good. Well, you certainly live in a beautiful place yes, and so I'm pretty. sure that it's uh, very inspirational to you as a creator. I love it. But my question for you is, and I know our listeners are going to know this, what exactly does a curator do? What does he do all day? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a kind of com- a fairly complicated question, a fairly easy one at the same time. I see a curator basically as a connector or as a facilitator, a conduit basically between a subject, an artist uh, and a viewer um, stroke the o- audience. Um, like in all the arts, it's 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 a multi-layered conversation between all the, the, these various parties. Um, and what I try and do is I try and find, um, I, I suppose, where, where, whatever museum or, or wherever I'm actually curating um, the work into, I try and find out what the museum is about, who their audience are, and then try and tailor my uh, group of artists to go in there to have a conversation with them. Um, so it's it's a it's a fairly straightforward process. Um, I often like to ask the artists and the museum to put on some kind of seminars or conversations between um, the artists, say from Ireland, um, and the artists wherever we're actually working That's out of, and yeah. just 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 to see how we can build a rapport. Because uh, I say mm-hmm. I see art as a conversation. As a little bit of I a like follow that. up on that. I like that. Where do you, art is a conversation. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. Where do you find uh, these artists? Well, uh, we're, I mean, we've only about five and a half million people here, but there's a huge community of artists in, in, in Ireland. Uh, there are very few galleries because there isn't the, I suppose, the, the financial backing to keep people going. So the artists would be, I suppose, consolidated in, in, in a number of centres. So I just keep an eye on what what's going on. I'd be members of the various artists associations and groups and stuff like that. And um, it's it's like I'm at the stage now where kind of people will come to me and ask to be involved in a project and um, we just, just kind of take it from there. So I would always try and put a number of people together in a group that actually worked mm-hmm. um, as individuals. So it's very much about the people taking part as the work is taking part. Because mm. if you've got people who don't get on together, the work might be brilliant. It's just not going to work as a project when you actually connect with the, with the, with the venue and the audience from that venue. Great answer. So basically I, I, can see, I can see why Angie and I wanted you as a guest. Yes, that's such a, a good answer. That's a <laughs> terrific answer. But I, I have it. a bit of a follow-up on that one. Um, mm-hmm. We know when it comes uh, to art, you're extremely well-educated in that area. Mm-hmm. Has that education impacted your curatorial ambitions? Um, I, I think it has in, in, in many ways. Um, a monk once said to me, you know, years and years ago, the day you stop learning, you'll be three hours dead. True. And um, he, he, was a, he was a wise guy. Now, I don't know how he figured out three three hours, but um, <laughs> I think it's, it's again, it goes back to, to the conversation. You know, you've got people who are teaching stuff and they're going to give you information and, you know, you're going to give that information back. Now, luckily, the art school process is is very kind of uh, fluid in that, you know, going to the pub or going to a restaurant, whatever, afterwards, you tend to learn more when you're actually talking to your tutors about what's about what's going on, what kind of information you have and how, you know, you're trying to build a rapport be- be- between them themselves. Um, I, I always see kind of education as being Again, a dialogue between people. Like, for for instance, if you've got, say, two people who see a painting of a building on fire, for instance, mm-hmm. um, one person was in a fire, the other person was not. Both are going to see the exact same painting in two totally different ways. So it's how do you negotiate your, route, your way around those experiences and what sort of, mm-hmm. um, I suppose, a result or dialogue would actually come out of that. And, and as I kind of see that as education. So, OK, I went to a number of institutions, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's a continuing long process. It was probably more focused when I went to these places. I think your comment that you made about uh, chatting with the instructors after class, mm-hmm. you, you know, they all mm-hmm. they all do basically the same thing. They have their uh, all their papers in front of them. They follow the routine that they've established their t- as they teach each class. And then once Absolutely. they're out of that class and they can 
let their hair down and say whatever they want, yeah, to say yeah. things that they're not being monitored. Or if they're talking, in your case, to a particular student who they admire, they might be more forthcoming with some of the info that they said. I know Angie's got the next question for you. Yeah, I, you know, I was I was wondering this personally. When did you decide to curate art exhibitions? Like, was there one particular event that you just went, that's it, this is going to make me a curator because I just feel so inspired to do it? Yeah, there was, there was one sort of, um, I, I suppose, I, I was in second year or just beginning second year in art college, and I kind of figured, okay, there's, there's, there's no structure for... Um, uh, you know, being an artist, you know, it's not like training someone to be a soldier or to be a mechanic yeah. or, you know, accountant or whatever. There's no actually kind of career structure. So I thought, well, I might as well just get, get on my bicycle and kind of just start to make my own at that stage. So there were a lot of uh, exhibitions, small little group exhibitions going on then. So I just organized people, uh, a bunch of my friends and that to take part in them. So we hire a van and take stuff off. And eventually we would just kind of um, ask people, could we borrow, you know, a, a derelict building or an unused building, whatever, and set up a kind of a pop-up show in that. Yeah. Um, the, the tutors in the college said, if I didn't stop, I was going to be expelled. <gasps> so oh. I said, <laughs> no. I said, no, I'm staying go I said, I'm staying going with this. And interesting enough, one of the head tutor actually wants to be part of the next show. Yeah, so naturally. I included them in. And that that was the end of the end of that. So it kind of just started from there. And um, I think in the arts, you got to make your own opportunities. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it probably been, one of the few. Yeah, it would have been their loss. Truth. Well, well, it's it's um, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're all we 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 all kind of try and I suppose do our part with whatever information we have and experience we have, and kind of take it from there. You know. Right. Do you only curate paintings, Maurice, or do you? delve into other types of art creations? Um, I, I generally try and stick with the fine arts, so sculpture, painting, drawing, print, photography. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know a lot about video. I certainly know video arts. I know conceptual artists, but they're they're a lot harder for to actually put on, yeah. um, you, you know, you know, abroad. Mm -hmm. um, like very often um, I, I, I be hugely kind of, um, I suppose, uh, helped by Department of Foreign Affairs and Culture Ireland. And, um, you know, there are other people who will be kind of, you know, working with them who will be able to work with video and dance and theatre and stuff like that. So I, I, I just find there's more than enough for me to work with in, 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 in the fine arts. Um, like I, I know the structures, how, how it works abroad. I know, um, yeah. you know, in general, the people, you know, you're working with, you know, how they think. And, you know, you're just trying to con continue with that. Um, I would love to be able to get into video and stuff like that, but it's I I don't think I know enough about it. You, really. you just right. you just perfectly set up Ng's next question. Right. <laughs> well, you know, curating the artworks of artists must cause you to have to deal with so many different personalities. Do you find that portion to be an easy task? Uh, it, it 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 can it can be difficult, but um, a lot of the artists see because the art world is so small here, you'd have a fairly good idea of who's who's talking to who and who mm -hmm. isn't talking to who. You know, it's I think it's the same in any any art community. So, you know, I, I'd always try and get together a group who would actually work together. So oh, it yeah. means that when it comes to kind of the conversations within uh, the gallery or the museum space or wherever it is, uh, you know how they're going to think, you know, the people you can try and pair them with to continue that conversation mm -hmm. um, with the, with the audience. Like for instance, um, we did a big show in China that was in, um, in fact, it's still out there going, but it's been held up because of COVID now. But, you know, we, we were, we were all doing interviews with, with local artists and, and people involved in the arts um, on national television. And we had a viewing of 80 million people. So, you know, with, with something like that, you've got to make sure that the people who are, you know, you're working with aren't going to let you down. And um, so it, it's, you very carefully have to pick the people that are going out as, as, as well as the work. Yeah. Like for instance, a few years ago, we had a big show and um, two of the people I knew just absolutely hated each other, but I only found this out afterwards. Luckily one of them got sick and wasn't able to travel. He had a heart condition. You know, so it kind of, that kind of helped oh, with that. That was but sad. He, but his work was fantastic, but you know, it's, yeah, the way it goes. yeah, I guess you don't know that. That is my follow-up to Angie's question. In fact, her and I have been discussing this for quite some time because we see it in our own experiences in our creativity mm. and dealing with people, even people for uh, this podcast. Right. Um, 
Mm-hmm. But yeah, you're, it's but kind you're of not, interesting. But you're not like that. You no, know, you're not like this. So, <laughs> but, but my my question is, um, we all know creative people that have egos, and some of them express them more outwardly than others. Does that ever influence mm. how you select art pieces for an exhibition? Uh, no, as, as I say, I'd, I'd always try and make, I, um, I always have a uh, equal number of men as an equal number of women for starters. Um, mm-hmm. I'd always try and make sure they all, you know, got on reasonably well together. Um, and I'd always try and have a very diverse amount of, you know, a grouping of works. So everything from kind of, you know, um, theoretical abstract work to, you know, very literal visual work. So there's always be something because when, when you're w- working outside of Ireland, you're representing Ireland, you know, and, you know, you don't want to offend people or insult people anyway. You know, you basically want to build and create a dialogue with your audience outside. So it, it would, you know, those, those concerns would always be foremost in, mm-hmm. in my thing. When you're representing uh, artists, that you're primarily representing these artists from Ireland and you're showing their work in other countries. Is that how you've been doing it? Uh, pr- pr- pretty much. Yeah. And, and also in, in, in Ireland as well, you know, I mean, there's lots of venues where, you know, um, I, I, you know, we, 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 we simply say, you know, can, can I, can I do a show with you or whatever? Mm-hmm. Um, like a museum phoned me up this morning and said, okay, we're closed at the moment, but we'd like to do a show. You know, can you put something together for us when we open maybe towards the end of the year? So, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's kind of, it's kind of everywhere. So I don't necessarily always work outside of Ireland. Oh, okay. Mm, Okay. And my question is when you are wearing your curator's hat, how does that influence your own artwork? Um, I, I, I think it influences my art in, in terms of, um, how, the I suppose the information uh, yeah. I, I I I get when I'm talking to to other people I would meet as 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 part of it. Um, it's 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 kind of a hard one to know. Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't think it influences this hugely. Yeah. Um, but certainly, um, I take on board things people will say about the work. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and they're not always you know necessarily. Uh, you know, good things, but it's it's a reaction, and I think it's always good for someone to have a reaction, right. yeah, good, right. bad. But that makes sense. Yeah, but not indifferent. Yeah, well, reactions, good or bad, just means you're. If they're bad, that means you're doing the right thing. Yeah. Well, that that's that's what I hear lots of artists say. So, you know. Well, also it it teaches you to have a little bit of a tough skin to really express it, yourself it, it, creatively. We love rejection. It, it <laughs> we love rejection. Well, certainly going to art school will we'll, we'll give you that. Because right. you, just, you get hammered from day one. Right on. You know, I, both Angie and I know you more as an artist. Yeah. I've been seeing your artwork posts on social media. Well, that's media. Well, how we met him yeah. on social media. I, I've been yeah. seeing him yeah. for yeah. quite some time. And um, Angie won't tell you this, but I will that sometimes I get a little jealous because you're pretty doggone good, my friend. <laughs> I, I, if, if I kind, and, and your, your, both your works are fantastic, you know, as, as I've, as I've, oh, I've posted in, in the comments on them. So, you know, you've, you've, you've nothing to worry about there. We'll edit that into a paid endorsement. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, a post. <laughs> um, we understand that you have organized art exhibitions in other countries, because you just mentioned mm-hmm. China, where were they held? And it seems to me that they would be in a logistical nightmare. Uh, it can't, they, 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 they can be hu- huge logistical, but um, if you stay away from the main uh, uh, carriers, yeah. um, it's much easier to work with smaller carriers. It's also much cheaper. Um, I've also found that, you know, you just roll something up in a pod and put it in the post. It works fantastic. I've never lost work that way. Um, so just you know, say in, in in terms of Hong Kong, I was in it was in a gallery in Hong Kong for years before they closed, and every year I would organise uh, a group of Irish artists uh, to go out there and you know to to to, to bring their work. It was always a great success, the great Irish uh, expat community. So whatever country um, you know you're working in, there's always an Irish expat country there, our, our audience there who will right. certainly support you. Um, and again, I found Department of Foreign Affairs are incredibly. Um, kind in in helping out with various projects. That's cool to know. Yeah, no kidding. You know, it, it's hard for most people to grasp, but a curator isn't just about curating an art show. Isn't exactly all about finding great works of art. There's a hard, a lot mm-hmm. of hard work that goes into it, 
and you manage to still have time to create art for yourself um, and give precious time to your family. How do you manage all that? Um, well, I, I suppose you know, I'm up early. And I go to bed fairly late at night, but I've I've, I've cut back a huge amount of, of the curating now to concentrate more on on, on the work. Okay. Um, you know, there, there are loads of other people out there doing uh, you know uh, curating as well. So you know, it's it's kind of time to to, to let them have have a go as well. I tend to kind of pick nice ones um, that, that I'd like to go with and and to work with people I've worked with before because you know the rapport is already. Uh, been built up over years, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and it's, it's lovely to be able to expand something, you know. I often think it's terrible, you know, if, you, if you're, a, you know, a teacher in art school and you're always only working with one year, you don't get to see them going all the way through and how the artist and how the student develops into an artist. And it's the same with curating. You kind of want, you know, to see, okay, you had a show in summer, say, three or four years ago, and then you kind of see, well, okay, if we do another show, maybe vary some of the artists this day, but I have a connection between the previous artists. How's that going to work? How is mm-hmm. how is the audience developed? You know, and mm-hmm. you, I, can, you, I can you see that. Done that. And, and that's fun. I it's can great. see that because it's kind of like an ensemble at that point. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And it's, it's good fun because, you know, the, the, you know, the great thing about the art business, you know, you make fantastic friends, you meet amazing people, you know, from you know from all walks of life and Mm -hmm. um and it's lovely and there's very few jobs and careers that will give you that you know kind of door opening there to to do that kind of thing so true because if you're working in an office you may not have that camaraderie like you do i think in the creative community so that's a really good point that you made yeah it it can be difficult i I was just going to ask you if someone wanted to pursue a career as a curator what would be your principal advice Okay, well, first advice, and I used to give the same advice to students when they were starting out, is don't, because, mm. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a career, like the arts, you know, all the arts across the, across the board is something that's totally unstable. If you want a stable family life and you want to, um, you know, live in a sense kind of a normal life, you're not going to get it from the arts. You have to be totally self-motivated. Um, you have to spend, you know, huge amounts of time where you have absolutely no money coming in, but you love doing it. And it is kind of kind of building it up that way. So if you're prepared to make that commitment, then then do it. I think okay. the best curators um, are the people who are art, who are practitioners themselves because they know how the stuff is made. And I think that's hugely important. That's a good point. I think the best curators and the best artists are the ones that don't like to eat a lot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. As, as somebody said to me once, you know, I, you know, uh, you know, I said it's cold and she said, well, paint faster, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> true. Funny. This is kind of a semi tricky question, I suppose. I wouldn't want to have to answer this one. Um, what is your <laughs> philosophy uh, when you approach the selecting an organization of an artworks for a show? Um, I think the primary philosophy is like, what, what's, what's the venue about? Um, you know, is it a museum? Is it, um, you know, is it a school? Is it a university? You know, um, you know, wh- wh- wherever it is, is it say, you know, very often shows when they're out in places tend to travel to say smaller venues outside, like in China is, is very, you know, um, a good case in point there. They will take out elements of the show and bring it out to uh, to schools, to, you know, to, to universities, to local kind of halls and that. And kind of, so it's very much about um, um, education. So I look to see what's, what, what the audience is, what, what the, the venue is about, who are the people are going to work, work to, who are the people are going to be going out there. And again, how do you build that dialogue from, from, from the ground up? That, that, that essentially is, and essentially the, the main thing is, I think is just, just meeting people and just, um, you know, just, just, I suppose, build, building a rapport with people outside of, you know, um, our own community here. Mm-hmm. Because the world is just a tiny place, really, at this stage. Well, and, both, uh, you know, you both, have- both Angie and I have been to China and we had the mm-hmm. opportunity to go to some galleries and museums. And the group mm-hmm. of people that we had with us, um, but they knew we were artists, of course. And they would mm-hmm. come up to us and their translators would come up to us. And before we knew it, we had a whole crowd of people standing around yeah, us asking really our Not opinions on this fun. painting and that painting and all this. It was actually 
quite fun, but it was also interesting to get their interpretations because right. their culture yeah. is light years away from it's very different. Angie and I, yeah. uh, Angie and mine, and, and mm. obviously yours too, Maurice. And it's kind of interesting Absolutely. when you go uh, and do a show or you're around different people from different cultures. I know uh, people from Italy, artists that we know from Italy, or especially artists from France, they have a different way of uh, perceiving art i you probably have witnessed this yeah, more than kind more of than a different you, sensitivity yeah different yeah. sensitivity uh, absolutely i mean you know most of the places you go to um you know you, you just the audience uh, participation is phenomenal uh, of course you know at home you know you know you can go to an opening and there might be one or two people at it mm-hmm. you know it's 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 very disheartening, but you know. But then again, you're kind of building a much big kind of a much bigger um, I suppose, scenario around when when you're when you're doing a show kind of out, outside of Ireland. But you know, it's 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 just the nature of, of the business, really. You know, um, but it, it it is so nice to have that connection there between you mm-hmm. know cultures and oh, art yeah. is the one thing that is its own language. You know, if you were hungry, something, you just draw a picture of some food or something like that. You know, you don't need to know the language, you know, uh, <laughs> you just draw a picture of a car. If you want a car. Or something. That's why you I know, practice it's... every day drawing a picture of a bologna sandwich. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll, you'll never go hungry. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, in the past, I wanted to ask guests this and I keep forgetting to do it. And this time I'm going to ask our guest, what is your workspace like? Oh, my work says, yes. ah, it's fairly big. I've just built a new um, a new studio space. It's nine meters by uh, eight and a half meters ground floor space. Uh, I sold my previous studio and decided I'd, I'd build this one. It's it's I've I've built and pulled down a bunch of buildings in the back garden and built this place here. Okay. Um, oh, nice. It, it's nice, big, very, very high ceilings. So I've no windows. I just got skylights. So I've got lots of light coming in, so I can hang work on the walls. Oh, Whereas previous spaces. Yeah, it's 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 fantastic. It's it's an absolute um, it's a privilege, it's a blessing to have such such a space. Now, I still need to finish painting the walls properly. I was too busy trying to make make put paint on canvas to 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 do it, but we'll get there. I have, I have two things I want to say. One, we're going to put links to your website and all of your contact information. Yeah. So maybe you, when you. you have a chance, you might. I know artists love looking at other artists' studios. They want oh, to send us say, some photos. Yeah, we'll they put say, it in. I do that. I don't do Absolutely. that. Why does that guy use that paint and all this other stuff? Yeah, yeah. I, hate, I hate that paintbrush. But if you could, yeah. um, you know, whatever you, when you have time, send us some photos because we'll put it on your bio page so people can oh, take it. a look. I think they everybody would enjoy that. Um, this is Maurice's studio. You. Everyone will want to see yeah. it. And, and, and you know, it's it's the one that, you know, you know, like I, I'm fascinated by other artists' studio, and it's an incredibly, um, what you call it, link between what we what we all do. You know, seeing our spaces. Oh yeah. You know, because we all know what a space is supposed to be, but everyone does it differently. And right. It's a brilliant dialogue between between all of us. I think. Exactly. So, do you ever have doubts? This you could ask any artist in the world this right. question, and you're going to get a whole bunch of different answers. Most of them will be lies, but I know you'll be real honest <laughs> about this. Do you ever have <laughs> doubts about what you're doing creatively? Oh, continuously, uh, just uh, day day and night. Um, it's it's always, and you know, when, when things get really really bad, I look at the Muppet Show, or I look at Gary Larson, or something like that, and just look at the kind of the. Um, I suppose the stupidity of of existence, and then sort of say, "Oh, just get on with it," you know. So, yeah, continuously, I I I, I have doubts. Um, I suppose, especially because, you know, in a sense, we're making something that very few people want. Very few people want to actually look at in terms of the amount of people in the world or understand and, um, it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, even more, yeah, even, even more so um, to understand it. So, you know, and you can think, well, does it make sense? And then you get to the stage where, you know. Like when I was younger, I used to write a huge amount about what I'm doing. Now I can't because I haven't a clue what it's about anymore because, you know, the visual problems that keep coming up. Mm-hmm. And you, do, you kind of think, oh, am I going in the right direction? Does this make any sense even to me? So, you know, it's, it's, you, just, you just have to try and pick your way forward. That's why I keep going back to the, the, the Muppet Show thing of the tree falling down, which eventually falls down on top of the guy trying to outstare it. <laughs> and um, it, it's like... That that's that's what happens when when the painting go bad. It does. It falls down on top of you, right. and um, you know. Then you got to crawl out and and get a fresh canvas and start again. 
Right. But you know what you just said is so valuable because I think that every creative person has a lot of doubts and a lot of feelings about what they're doing. Is is this right? Am I going the right direction? So it's really very yeah. comforting to hear you say that because I think we're all on that level where you're doing things and you think it's going to be good, but you still have questions. I think you have to approach it like you're a scientist because mm-hmm. all you're yeah. ever doing is you're experimenting. True. You just exactly. every every single painting is an experiment. You don't generally know what's right. what's going to end up unless maybe you're painting a tree that you've painted 10,000 times. You have a pretty good idea how that's going to come out. Right. But if you Absolutely. paint more abstractly, look out. There, there is no yeah. uh, definitive trueism involved there at all. So true. Absolutely, because you've, you've no safety net when you're painting, you know, um, abstractly or even semi-abstractly because, you know, every mark on there has to justify itself where you can make a, you know, say for a sky and clouds, you know, you can make a kind of squiggle, whatever, that mm-hmm. kind of shorthand, you know, you know, it's going to be represent the sky, whatever. So in a sense, your job is done there. Mm-hmm. But when you're trying to kind of paint something into something that's in your head mm-hmm. um, and you don't have a language for it, it's trying to, how do you develop and how do you um, grow that language? Right. Is, I think is the difficult part. Like that, grow the language. That's very nice. Thank you. Um, let's see. What else did I want to ask? I wanted to ask, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Um, I see myself uh, showing with the uh, Gagosian galleries. Oh, there you, there go. you go. I applaud that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wonderful. A, a, friend of my, a friend of mine knew Larry Gagosian years ago, and he said he started off selling posters um, at, at Venice Beach. You know, So I kind of, you know, he's got the number one gallery in the world pretty much at this stage. And right. I don't know. I, I think, why not? You know? Exactly. Why not? I like that. Yeah. Well, he had a fixed audience <laughs> at Venice Beach, let me tell you. Yeah, he, he did. did. He did. he did, absolutely. But a good place to start. Yeah, and then what um, What do you want to be most remembered by? You do two things. You're ah. a curator, you're a teacher, obviously. Right. You're very uh, conversant in art and creativity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what do you want to be, and, all, and you're a very talented artist, what do you want to be most remembered by? Well, I, I kind of see the only the only proof that we were here is what we leave behind. Um, there's a saying, I think it's an Australian saying, and it's it's basically a good tracker can track a man by the mark he shadow left a week previously. And I kind of see us and our Great. existence as the shadows and the objects that we make, you know, are, are there. Um, we're gone and it's up to whatever to interpret and stick it in the fire or whatever or they can put it on a wall or whatever but you know it's 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 the only remembrance that that, that, that actually there um mm-hmm. you know we can take a photograph you often see these uh, victorian photographs which are quite popular now uh, um of people you're trying to make them out and you're saying you know, what's, what's that about what are these people about but you can't but if you see something somebody actually made you know you see a painting by money or or um you know a drawing by raphael or whatever and you kind of think you know you get more inside their head so i, I think art Art does that. It, it makes the shadow or the mark of the shadow stronger. Well, that, it's interesting you say that because isn't that how we perceive early man? We look at early man by the tools he left. Absolutely. Or the, dra- or or the drawings paintings. he put on cave paintings. Yeah. Yeah. That's, absolutely. We, don't know, we don't know anything about them other than what we've learned from their tools and what we've really yeah. learned from their cave paintings, which are extraordinary. They are extraordinary. A- absolutely. And we feel much closer to them because of that. You know, say the one where they, sp- they put their hand on the wall and they spray a kind of, you know, they spray the, the mud around it. So you've just got a space where their hand was. You know, mm-hmm. they've touched that space, you know. God knows how many thousands of years ago, but you know it's it's almost as if it's done yesterday. Because as as mark makers, as artists, we understand that, so you know we're immediately connected with them. So you know that rapport is there. It would be almost impossible to walk up to that and not want to put your own hand over their yeah. hand. Yeah, absolutely, and exactly. connect, absolutely, and connect yeah. with them yeah. somehow. Yeah, absolutely, that would be fantastic to 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 be able to do that. But obviously, you know, with the assets in our hands now, we can't do stuff like that. But uh, right. you know, at least we can think of it or whatever. Right. Or exactly. you can, t- or you can uh, print a picture out on your printer, and increase the size, and it. put your hand on it. <laughs> I don't think it's, it's the uh, same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's probably the nearest facsimile thereof, as they say. You know? <laughs> right on. 
Um, and our next question, um, we came up with this last week, and I thought it was an interesting answer. So I think we're going to ask you, too, if you could sit on a park bench and chat with anyone from the past, who would it be? Well, um, interesting thing in, in China, uh, I think probably about 16 years ago, I was visiting the uh, Hungshan Mountains, the yellow, or the yellow Mountains. It's basically where Chinese landscape or current or landscape Chinese landscape painting came came out of or developed out of and it's above the cloud line so basically clouds are coming in things disappear it's this huge um volcanic kind of needles uh stone needles and um I was sitting there looking at it, and then this guy just came along and sat down beside me and we just stared at this kind of this drama it's like a stage set going on mm-hmm. and he said to me um who is your master and I said Jesus and I said who is his master and he said Confucius and um, so if I was to sit down beside, I would sit down beside Jesus. I wouldn't have any questions to ask him because I don't believe there are any questions. I don't believe there certainly aren't any answers. But I think to be in his presence is 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 what I would like. And I think I would mm. gain a huge understanding of what the whole, what, what 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 it's all about just 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 by doing that. Beautiful. So yeah, Jesus, I think. Wonderful. Beautifully stated. Yeah. Oh, and, thank you. Yeah, Maurice, you've shared some really interesting thoughts and ideas about art curating and creativity and i know angie and i oh, speak yes. for both of us but she'll say hers uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be in this interview you uh were very informative i know people are going to really love hearing what you have to say plus we know people are going to want to reach out to you so we'll have all your contact info on our web page i know people can do a search for you on instagram wherever and they can uh see what you're currently doing artistic or art wise. Um, but thanks again. We really appreciate having you on. Yes. And just letting everyone know out there, if you want to know more about Maurice, we will have the links in the show notes of all of his places you can connect with them. And also under the show guest tab, if you want to see what Maurice looks like and get to know him a little better, you can go on our thought row podcast.com under show guest uh, tab and click on that. So everyone can visit Maurice's website and learn more about him and be able to connect with him if you'd like on social media. Fantastic. Thank, thank you guys so much. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking with you. And um, I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Take All care right. now. Great. Thank you, Definitely. Maurice. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, Maurice. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm really glad you tuned in today. We hope you enjoyed the thoughts and ideas we shared with you. We post a new podcast every week, so remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. So it's bye for now from my husband Rod and I, wishing everyone... A great day.